what a beautiful evening and, a, and what a great turnout. Thank you all for coming. It's going to be very, very interesting. Learn, we'll be able to learn tonight. Very informative. And I can't wait until it all gets started. My name is Lynn Bauer. I'm the co chair of the AFCON here in Lincoln. Uh, we meet the second Wednesday of every month. And we would love to have you be part of our um, commission. Um, we'd love to see visitors there. And plus, we have a couple openings that we would love to have people come and see if they'd like to be an official part of our team. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ari Kurtz to you. Ari is from Linden Tree Farm here in Lincoln. It is also part of the AdCon. And he will be um, monitoring um, tonight's um, symposium. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming, and thanks to the Agriculture Commission, and particularly Charlotte Trim for organizing tonight's events. Um, so this evening, we are pleased to have two great speakers on the topic of soil health, Dan Kittredge and Pete Lowy. For too long, we have uh, modern industrial agriculture looked at soil health when they have looked at it at all as a separate issue from the, from the food system. The soil has frequently been seen as an inert substance to manipulate with chemical inputs rather than a complex biological realm teeming with microbes, bacteria, fungi, earthworms, and many more that live in the soil in a symbiotic relationship with the plants. We now understand that in healthy soil, we grow healthy, nutrient-dense plants that are vital to provide people and animals with a healthy diet. Our speakers tonight are farmers and innovators with a deep understanding of the soil who will share with us some of the strategic practices that have helped them work successfully to produce thriving agricultural systems and delicious food. So Dan Kittredge grew up in the center of the organic agriculture movement of New England. His parents, Jack Kittredge and Julie Rawson, helped found NOFA, New England uh, Northeast Organic Farmers Association. And his parents, Coleman Farm, became the organizational center. So from an early age, Dan attended and then led workshops at NOFA conferences that bring together for three days every summer and a day in the winter leaders in various fields of agriculture from all over the nation, but particularly homegrown ones from New England, to share their knowledge and experience. Dan later immersed himself in the Acres Eco Agriculture community, a large Midwest-based group of farmers and researchers dedicated to biological farming. Now Dan lives with his wife and children on a 24-acre homestead in central Massachusetts, where he raises two acres of salad greens and vegetables, including a half acre under plastic for direct restaurant sales and raises grass-fed beef on 15 acres. For the past six years, Dan has taught two-day courses on the principles of biological systems in many parts of the country, averaging 10 to 15 courses a year. Dan has as his ultimate goal to work towards increasing the quality of our food supply. And then we'll be Pete Lowy. Pete, one half of Pete and Jen's back here at Birds. Met his wife and partner, Jen, at the University of California, Santa Cruz Agricultural Program, where the emphasis on composting and feeding the soil, not the plant, attracts people from all over the country. He then worked with Jean-Paul Cortens, a pioneer leader an organic and CSA movement at Roxbury Farm, a 375 acre diversified operation in Kinderhook, New York, producing vegetables, A, beef, lamb, chickens, pigs, for 1,400 families. This season, Pete and Jen are raising for direct marketing two to 3,000 meat birds. Six to 700 laying hens, 90 pigs, 500 rabbits, and 100 turkeys. One of which we really enjoy. Thank you. 
on the land they're currently leasing in Concord. Meanwhile, Pete has been working full time as the assistant manager at Barrel Farm, while Jen has headed up the new entry sustainable farm project. Incredibly, running their farming business in their spare time with only one full time hired worker. Pete is particularly interested in integrating vegetables and multi species animal production in a sustainable farming operation. So, please save your questions for after both speakers, where there will be time for questions and answers. Thank you very much for coming, and we hope you enjoy the presentation. So, let's welcome Anne Pete. Take, so I said, oh, I'll take organic chemistry. 
I don't know my final exam, I think it was like a 35, but I, I passed as a D because they graded over the curve. And that's where agriculture is now. Agriculture is being graded over the curve. The curve is really quite low in relation to what's possible. That's just quantity, not quality. So anyway, this is a you know, well-recognized principle, so here's a nice picture. Um, why river valleys? River valleys are areas that have annual process of flooding. Um, you heard about this, the silt is dropped on the land. Those minerals that are taken off in the crop are annually replenished in the soil. So you can, in the Nile, harvest crops for 4,000 years in a row, or 6,000 or 8,000 years in a row, off the same land, if you're actually putting back it's being taken out. How revolutionary of a concept is that for anyone here? Actually, it's I think fairly revolutionary, even though it's self-evident if you consider it. Um, so how does nature do remineralization, if you want to call it that, that process of reapplying those minerals to the soil, glaciation, uh, volcanism, and erosion? Erosion is the one that's causing the river valleys to um, stay good. Uh, glaciation, people familiar with glaciation, um, and volcanism as well. Um, um, in glaciation, I'm not sure maybe people are probably don't invest in land in Iowa, who knows where it does, but um, I think it's I-40, which goes across about one third up the state. And just north of I-40 is a little ridge of hills. And that ridge of hills is where the glacier stopped. And south of I-40, land is worth eight to ten thousand dollars an acre. And north of I-40 it's worth about eighteen to twenty thousand dollars an acre. The inherent yield that is realized in that area of Iowa makes it worth more than the inherent yield of the land in the south of Iowa. That's 10,000 years ago, right? Glaciers? Um, anyway, we can talk about it. Well, well, we can talk about it. I don't have time for it. Um, Bioaccumulator plants are um, an interesting piece of the puzzle. Anybody read the book 1491? I'm just going to here. I read 1491. 1491 is a really, really good history book about what the Americans were like just before White man came, and I mean, if you read the original history, even from the you know post 1600, 1700s, the average Native American was a head taller than the average European. A head taller. Um, the rivers were you know jumping with fish. The trees were safe to the king. The king trees because they were you know 200 feet tall, 300 feet tall. These massive trees. Um, George Washington. I started with the George Washington the Cherry Tree. He was a, a, a surveyor. He went to uh, Central New York, Finger Lakes, and cut down 10,000 um, massive old growth fruit trees that the uh, Native Americans were growing there. What was being done in this country, on this, sorry, on this continent, in the Americas, as far as management of land, was not agriculture as we currently practice it, but agriculture much more like uh, the perennial polyculture or permaculture where different plants are being grown together, animals are flowing through. It's the um, savanna of Africa, that process of really working with nature. And so if you work with nature, and this is um, a topic that is very touching, and I probably don't want to go into the science of it because you'll lose respect for me about what I think. But if you work with nature, um, the land can actually grow with vigor. Um, that's just, there's science behind this, but it violates a lot of what we think is true in our Western science. So. Um, we'll say that for a longer conversation, but how does nature build soil? There's a few different ways that the soil is revitalized. Um, I'm going to use the Amazon as an example of an area that has not been remineralized recently. Um, the Amazon, a lot of the equatorial regions of the, of the planet are very weather-worn soils. They're called laterite soils. Um, they go and they harvest uh, aluminum by digging up the soil, right? It's called bauxite. Um, you just dig up the soil. Everything else has been leached out through millions of years of rain. There's nothing left. So in the Amazon, they're cutting it down, and all the minerals that are in the trees are being, you know, released and made available for crops to grow for three or four years, and then the soil is worn out, um, and it happens very rapidly there. Uh, we live in a glaciated region, but we're leaving this larger question of soil and how to take care of it. So there's a nice picture for you of the Amazon. Um, red, right? Not a lot of organic matter. Not a lot of life active in there. It's just the minerals that are in those trees that are going to burn down, that are going to build the crop, give them a nice big crop for a couple of years, and then move on. Um, so, not to spend too much time on that, people familiar with what's going on there. Um, I already said that I have a 
um, for the past two years been looking into a deeper analysis of the science behind soil and how to work with it. I think there's a really good uh, there's a, a really good uh, foundation of literature on the topic. And I brought a few books over here in the corner. Um, but anyone that wants to look into this, it's a really very intriguing, very exciting um, field. And I think it actually has the opportunity to solve a number of deep systemic issues. But I'm going to get to that at the end. Um, I like to use Dr. William Albrecht as my sort of front man, like a hiding behind, because he was a university professor in agronomy. He actually chaired a soil department for 20 years at a major land grant university. Happened to be from the mid 30s to the mid 50s, um, but that's the last time, as far as I'm concerned, good research on the topic was done with land grants. That's a whole other question. Um, Albrecht did his um, grad research and uh, PhD research overlaying World War I draft records on soil types. Put that together in for a second. The physical condition of the draftees from various geographies um, varied. And the boys from, from the Midwest, from the Corn Belt, from Iowa and Illinois, um, were accepted at, at a rate, I think it was 20% higher than the boys from the Ozarks and Appalachia. The boys, and the way that it was determined whether you were fit to be blown up or you know, um, gassed or whatever in the trenches of World War, World, World War I, the way that it was determined whether you were fit was the same way that a horse was determined to be fit. Whether you had good teeth and good feet. If you could march for 20 miles and you could eat heart attack, then you were fit to be a soldier because in the Civil War, which was the last war, that's what they needed. <laughs> People that could eat heart attack and march for 20 miles. And if you have bad teeth or, or, or you know, poor arches, then you weren't accepted. And they were accepted at much higher rates, um, like I said, in the uh, um, plain states than they were in Appalachia. Um, and if you think about the soils there, there was actually dramatically different soils there. Um, so Albrecht thought this was really intriguing. He was a farm boy himself from Illinois, and, and he decided to do some research. And he took clay, um, and he put it through a centrifuge, and spun out everything that was attached to the clay until he had just pure clay. He spun out the calcium, the magnesium, the potassium, everything else. And then he would add into different experimental po uh, pots or plots you know, 55% calcium here, and 12% magnesium there, and 3% potassium here, and 65% calcium, and 12% potassium, uh, magnesium, and 3% potassium. He did all these really, really interesting experiments. He grew crops in those soils, and then he fed those crops to rabbits, and horses, and rats, and chickens. And he was able to, in two generations, go, you know, add 50% body weight to rab uh, rabbits. Um, to cause animals to get smaller and sicker, to cause them to die younger, based on the minerals in the soil that grew the crops that they ate. Everybody got that? This is USDA land grant research in the third, actually it was his PhD work in the 20s. We've known this for a long time. We know, we know the science is not old, it's not new, it's not complicated. It's really quite exciting. Um, I got into it because I'm a farmer. And I grew up on a farm where we had lots of pests and diseases on our crops, and we didn't make much money and we work well at it. And when I got married and I had no other skill set besides farming, I said, uh oh, <laughs> I don't like to work that much. <laughs> this trajectory looks, you know, not very enticing. And I bet, I, if I'm an organic farmer, and organic is supposed to be better, because I was brought up with this idea that organic is better. If organic is supposed to be better, shouldn't our plants be healthier? Shouldn't our plants not succumb to infestation and disease? Right? It's this idea where if I've got a cold and I'm coughing and sniffling and the windows are closed and we're in this room together for an hour, that everybody here is going to breathe my germs, but not everybody's going to get sick. Right? Some people are going to get sick and some people aren't. It's not because you weren't exposed to the germs, it's because you have a strong immune system. And if organic is better, my plants should have a strong immune system. That's like a common sense, intuitive farmer you know, kind of thought. But I'm lazy. <laughs> I don't want to work too hard. So I bet there's a better way. And so that was what led me to this research. And it's been very exciting because um, I can live on the land and have a wonderful quality of life with my children and um, not work very much. Uh, it's quite it's quite nice. Anyway, um, so yeah, Albrecht came up with this concept called base saturation, um, which 
you know, looks at your soil in a very rudimentary fashion. I'm not sure who was asked the question. Who was it that asked the question at the beginning about? So just some book that would just tell us what to do. Who was it? Some woman here. Raise your hand. She came up to me very vociferously and expressed this desire. Um, you know, Albrecht's work lays it out pretty well. It's pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, okay, so you know, for me, the real question here is, uh, what do we do about it? If everybody sort of grants the basic points I've laid out here, um, what do we do about it? How do you take care of the soil? How do you take care of plants? What are the logistical um, processes that we just, is done? And that's what I want to spend the most of my time on. If I got 10 minutes at the end, I'll go off the end. Um, and I'm still cogitating about how deep I'll go off the event. That's a different conversation. Okay, so moving forward, um, we need to understand what do crops need to flourish and um, how can we create reality when they do, right? Um, maybe there's a correlation there between the crops that you're eating and your body. There's a foreshadowing for you of what's coming. Um, so, um, how do plants grow in nature? Anybody ever wonder about that? How nature does it? Is this, uh, it's, a, it's like a thing now called biomimicry. For biomimicry, nature figured out how to do most things better than we did. We have thus far. So let's try to emulate nature, try to understand nature, and then use that as a process by which we move forward. Um, people know about nitrogen, they're supposed to add nitrogen to the soil to grow crops. You've heard about N, P, and K, nitrogen. You need nitrogen, right? How many pounds of N are used to grow your crop of corn, et cetera, et cetera? How many pounds of N are used to grow your pine tree, or your maple tree, or your burdock, or your right? golden rod? Right? Nature grows just fine without applying any N, except that she does. But how does she do it? If we look at how nature does these things, and we try to emulate them, then we can create a reality where our crops are flourishing and not infested, um, which is nature's way of telling us that we're failures. Right? Nature doesn't give you an A or a B or a C. She gives you uh, Mycophthora or um, you know, Colorado potato beetle or late blight. Right? That's nature's report card, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, plants that are healthy are resistant to these things. Plants that are not, don't, are not. Um, okay. So for me, the foundation of the answer to the question um, has to do with the roots of the soil, which is the sort of topic of the night. Um, interesting little factoid for you. Most people have heard of uh, photosynthesis. They know that um, you, you use water and carbon dioxide and sunlight to make sugar and oxygen. This is the process that goes on with chloroplast. Um, the thing that most people don't know is that something on the order of two thirds, as much as two thirds, of the sugar that's manufactured in the leaf is taken by the plant and brought down through the stem, through the root, and injected into the soil. Nature takes at least a majority, if not more, of the sugar that she manufactures in the leaf and puts it into the soil. So, why? Right? Because plants are basically these big green solar collectors that are making sugar, so that's they are really good at. Um, and they do that because the soil life, the bacteria and the fungi in the soil, are functionally the gut of the plant. In the same way that we need people living inside of us to live. You all heard about this one? You hear about this? That is subtract. What percentage of the DNA in your body is human? Ten. Ten percent of the DNA in your body is human. Ninety percent of the DNA in your body is not human. Um, we are entirely and thoroughly colonized by a vast quantity of bacteria and fungi, without whom we could not exist. When you're born, there are zero people living between your mouth and your rear end. And the first thing that comes out of the breast before milk is called colostrum. And colostrum's full purpose is to establish that digestive system, that symbiotic relationship with life that gives us the ability to, be, to, to live and to flourish. And this is foundational, I think, to understanding humans and human health as well. Ayurveda, the ancient science of the, of, uh, the Indians, is you know, centered on the gut and the health of the gut. When the gut is healthy, everybody else is healthy. When 90% of your DNA is symbiotic, you're going to be fine. It's when it's pathogenic. It's when the gut is not healthy that you're not fine. And the same with the plant. So the plant uses the majority of the sugar to exude into the soil, and it adds to these little sugars, the little amino acids, which tell it, I'd like some cotton, please. I'd like some sulfur, please. You know, if you had a little phosphorus, that'd be great. Right? And those little amino acids, those sugars attached to amino acids are food for different 
different species of bacteria and fungi, and some are good at solubilizing phosphorus, and some are good at solubilizing um, copper, etc. And so when the plant needs phosphorus, it injects the food for phosphorus solubilizers into the soil, and the phosphorus solubilizers eat it, they reproduce, they go about their merry lives, they solubilize phosphorus, they digest it, and then they die. How long is the life cycle of a bacterium? Anybody? A couple hours? Four hours? So food for these guys, they go live their whole life cycle, they die, and then boom, the plant sucks up their protoplasm as food. Not a simple phosphorus ion, or phosphate ion, but a really complex compound that that plant can use to build its body. The same way we work, work with, our, with our soil life, with our gut life, same thing. Um, all right. Um, healthy plants inject 60% of the sugar manufactured to leaves in the soil. They do this to feed the bacteria and fungi in the soil, which function as their digestive system. Um, these bacteria and fungi do that as the basis for soluble nutrients, digest them, and then feed them to the plant. That's a technical explication of what I just said. Um, soil life, I like to think, are the bottom of the food chain. Have you heard of George's Banks? George's Banks is where all the fish would go, right? From New Jersey to New Brunswick, all the fish would go to George's Banks. Why? It's where the fish are, right? Who the hell goes to the fish are? Why are all the fish in the same spot? Because the environmental conditions are appropriate. Because they have sunlight and they have warmth and they have nutrients, they've got all the, the environmental conditions necessary for the bottom of the food chain to flourish. And when the phytoplankton flourish, everybody out the food chain for flourishes. This is foundational, you know, rudimentary. People understand this. Um, so, from my perspective, growing a healthy plant, which is like a tuna fish in the supply chain, is not about feeding tuna fish. It's about creating the environment where tuna fish food is flourishing. Right? Nothing radical about that. Um, so, only when soil life is receiving what it needs can it flourish. Only when it flourishes can the plant flourish. Only when the crop flourishes should we even eat those crops expect to flourish. Um, only when crops flourish should farmers who grow them expect to flourish. There's a little tangent uh, or a little corollary from my personal perspective. Um, and anybody who's on the Ag Commission who wants their local farmers to flourish. Um, so what does soil life need? This is really getting down to brass tacks here. If it's about soil life, what do they need? They need air to breathe. They need water to drink. They need food to eat. Um, sugar from the plant and out of the soil. They need nutrients or elements for the biochemistry to function. They need that copper and that zinc and that boron, that cobalt and soil as much as we do and the plant does. And they themselves need to be present. And we have a lot of situations where toxins have been applied to the soil which have functionally knocked out complete families of species. Not species, but families. Maybe five of species have been knocked out. Depending on the history of how your soil has been treated. Right? Think about, maybe this is the map of the nuclear fallout of North America since the 40s. <laughs> We've all been dumped on, right? DDT, uh, acid rain, whatever your, you know, whatever the, you know, um, toxin du jour is, um, where we live has really been hit heavy. And a lot of the species themselves have been taken out. So that's a piece of the puzzle. Not just the environmental conditions, but them themselves they need to be taken care of. So if you're a grower, what do you do? Um, I wrote down for air, you want to minimize compaction. So if you can't stick your finger down more than two inches into the soil without you know, getting a jam to raise your fingernail, there's probably not much air down there below two inches. That means all the people that are feeding the plant are dead. Right? So you want to have loose soil. That's why farmers till. Tillage is very destructive, but it's even worse if there's no air. At least they've got a chance to live if there's air in the soil. That's why farmers till. It's not a good thing to do, but it's better than having a totally compact soil. Um, so, by, by hook or by crook, you want to minimize compaction. Minimizing tillage is very helpful. Uh, keeping the soil covered is foundational. I like to say, where in nature do you see bare soil? Anybody? Beach. Beach, yeah. That's not, that is a little bit of nature, not a hell of a lot. Yeah. And it's deserts where nature is not doing really that well, right? So nature does everything she can until she's dead to keep herself covered. I like to say she's modest. I mean, you can go whatever you want. The, things, but uh, nature does seem to keep herself covered if she can. So um, if you've got a garden where your plants are in nice little rows and there's bare soil in between them, maybe you're violating nature. That's not how she does things. Maybe that's not, that's not a good thing to do. Um, I find that when I keep my soil covered, I do a couple other things. The levels of earthworms in the soil are just ridiculous. Um, 
I like to go out at night, and maybe I'll go home tonight and take my flashlight out. Just go off in the dark because what I see there going on is, um, by all intents and purposes, or for all intents and purposes, an orgy. Right? I mean, there are hundreds of night crawlers going at it. Right? It's all over the place. And guess what? You need 12 or 18 per square yard to till your soil eight times a year. Right? 40,000 pounds of earthworm castings per acre. 20 tons. Anybody ever bought earthworm castings? A few buyers were casting, right? They, the, a corollary value of keeping your soil covered is you've got food for soil life and the whole spectrum of soil life. Earthworms are on top. If earthworms are flourishing and everybody else is flourishing, but they are facilitating the openness and the looseness of the air and the water and everything flowing up and down. Um, um, the larger the root system, um, the deeper the roots, the more those pathways are being open as well. So um, if you want to take care of keeping your soil aerated, those are some good strategies. Um, if you want to keep your soil moist, um, keeping the soil covered as well, again, is, is beneficial for this process. People have seen bare soil, which dries up rapidly, especially the spring we had, and soil covered by hay or plastic or an old you know, paper bag, anything, is much more moist than soil that is bare. Um, minimize the compaction again, um, establish the root systems again, and irrigation. Uh, for those of us who have gardens, um, we go through periods of functional drought like we had in the last sort of month and a half. Um, maintaining hydration is foundational. You must have water in the soil. Um, the life cycle of bacteria is two hours. It doesn't take many days in the soil being dead or dry for your soil life to be dead. I like to call it um, genocide, um, which some people get a little bit offended by. But you know, functionally, hundreds of billions of organisms are now dead. Hundreds of billions are now dead because of how you treated the soil. If you want to think about it from a rudimentary level, now this is, this is a fact. fact, fact. Um, so irrigation is good. I use drip tape on my farm. I have three lines of drip tape for every four foot bed. And you know, I can keep the soil moist fairly readily with almost no effort um, through that technology. It was developed by the Israelis in the Negev Desert to grow vegetables. Drip tape is extremely efficient, uh, keeps the soil moist, and keeps you through a dry period. Um, uh, manage the carbon by cover cropping. People know about cover cropping, perhaps clover and um, there's oats and vetch and rye and field peas. There's all these different things you can put in the ground. I like to say around the beginning of September, um, maybe end of August to the middle of September, that time frame, um, watch the weather for a tropical storm. That depends on a nice tropical storm or a big thunderstorm coming through. Uh, take your cover crop seed under soak in your garden at that point. Don't wait until you pull everything out in November because the cover crops are only going to get an inch and a half tall before they establish. Your tomatoes are not going to be threatened by oaks that are three inches tall in the middle of September, right? So, and your, your kale and your winter squash and cucumbers and everybody else is probably dying by then anyways. Throw those cover crops down as soon as possible. Keep that soil green and alive through the entire year, if at all possible. Uh, mulching, I use a lot of, uh, do a lot of mulching on my farm. Uh, minimizing tillage again, high bricks. I will talk about bricks in a minute. <clears throat> Managing for minerals by amending the deficient elements. Ideally, you take a soil test. It's a really good process. Um, I just suggest that the fall equinox is a great time in September because most tree plants are already on the way down, if not dead already. And find out what's not there and put it down. Just put those things in. Um, uh, from my perspective, if you emulate nature um, and utilize, you, you want to use natural, inexpensive, local materials, uh, rock dust and seawater have basically everything you can to remineralize your soil, and intelligent use of those two things. Um, which rocks have which minerals, right? We know the ocean has 92 different elements in it. Um, um, you want to allow natural biodiversity as much as possible. Like I said, Native Americans were managing um, this continent in a, in a very much of a permaculture manner, and there seemed to be great abundance and vigor and vitality. I think it's a lot to the symbiosis of different species growing together. You want to have the trees and the, you know, the uh, berries and nuts and you know uh, all the kind of vines and then maybe some annuals on, underneath. All those things growing together really actually does um, have a very positive impact on the life and the mineralogy and everything else. Um, minimizing monoculture is basically a corollary at that point. Um, you want to ma manage the microbiology by inoculating. You same way you take a, um, a lactobacillus to inoculate your gut. You can take uh, spores to inoculate your soil. 
Uh, it's really simple, it's really inexpensive, um, and you can buy spores, right? It's the same thing. If you know those pieces are not present or you're concerned they may not be present, um, really minor use of uh, efforts can confirm their presence. Uh, remineralizing, minimizing tillage, establishing polycultures uh, might be mineralizing. Anybody here ever experimented with being a vegetarian? Uh, maybe some of you have been told uh, by your doctors that you needed to uh, supplement your diet with vitamin B12. We have heard about vitamin B12. Um, a plant-based diet, they say, does not have enough vitamin B12 for you to uh, flourish and function well. Vitamin um, B12 is the, is the lay term for the scientific name to compound uh, cyanocobalamin. And cyanocobalamin is the, is the one I'd like to focus on. Um, what that means, cyanocobalamin, is an element of cobalt with a few things stuck onto it. A couple of amino acids attached to it. Vitamin B12 is a cobalt-based compound, quite a different enzyme that you may look at it. Um, and your plant-based diet does not have enough cyanocobalamin, or functionally cobalt, um, for you to flourish. And if you don't have enough, you become anemic. And if you really don't have enough, you become dead. Right? We are cobalt-dependent organisms. Um, and we are building ones. Uh, actually, plants are also cobalt dependent. And actually, soil life is cobalt dependent. 80% of the 4.5 billion species of soil life that are presumed to exist are vitamin B12 dependent. So, if you don't have enough cobalt in your soil, as an example, then 80% of the species that are the symbiotes, the ones that feed your plant, can't exist. It's this beautiful interrelated system where all the pieces of the puzzle must all be present. There's no air they can't breathe, there's no water they can't drink. There's no food they can't eat. They need all these things to exist. That's all we're talking about. It's very rudimentary and apparently are very revolutionary because we're looking at multiple things at once. Something that PhDs have been trained for a long time not to do, right? This is the Revolutionary Farmer Act, is to look at it as a living organism and treat it as such. And guess what happens if you do? Um, okay. So I think it's getting hot in here. As you said, people sort of struggling. Can you open a couple windows if possible? Um, yeah, I think the more windows open before. It feels like it's about me or not here. I see people nodding off. I think they want to stay awake. I want to stay awake. Thank you. All right. Um, so a corollary, I said, of this growing healthier plants is that they are um, resistant to pestilence and disease. Uh, I'd like to start this explication off with a metaphor or a story that is sort of a experiment. Um, if there was a bale of hay in here on the floor somewhere, and one of you came in late looking for a chair, you might have considered sitting on it, but I'm guessing none of you would have considered eating it. However, if a cow or a goat came up the stairs and into this room, one of the first things they would have seen would have been that bale of hay. And they would have seen that as food. And why is it food for a cow and not food for us? Why is hay Food for a cow, not food for us, and the answer is because the cow has four stomachs. The cow has the ability to digest cellulose and turn it into food, we don't. Right, Eric knows that, we learned that somewhere a long time ago, probably. Um, so we understand the concept that different species of life have different functional digestive systems. So if you understand that concept, think about a bacteria or a fungi, or maybe even a larval form of an insect. The larval forms of insects don't have livers. They can't digest protein. So um, this is the secret to the point here. Um, I like to think of, like I said, bacteria and fungi that eat our plants or eat us um, as nature's garbage pool. Um, if anybody here had a flesh-eating disease, a, a flesh-eating fungus that was eating the skin off their arm and maybe even their, the meat off their bones, they would consider that to be a serious problem, right? <laughs> That's another statement for you. Um, it's my form of humor. Um, if you've got a tomato, which is being eaten alive by late flight, say, that counts as a flesh-eating fungus, just eating them alive, that's going to cause them to die shortly. I think probably a lot of the people in this room have experienced or heard about you know, um, late flight. Um, you could talk about you know, insects eating our flesh of life, and that would be your cholera or, you know, I mean, 
you want, if you want to talk about it, our plants are really in rough shape, and nature's telling us that we're not listening because we want to think we're good people. We're taking care of our plants well. And that even potentially those plants that we're growing are good for us. But if nature's trying to take them out, and we're doing everything we can to tell nature to shut up, and maybe we're risking something. Um, the way I understand the biochemistry is that the plant is unable to turn simple sugars into carbohydrates, which is a basic foundational process of biochemistry. If the, if the plant does not have the ingredients necessary to turn simple sugars into carbohydrates, it is susceptible to what we call soil-borne pathogens. And this is too much um, for you guys, but this mycoptera and mycoptony and epidium and verticillium. There's various diseases that are called soil-borne pathogens, and they eat simple sugars but can't make those carbohydrates. The next thing we have is the larval forms of insects. We can talk about flower and beetle. I said maybe a tomato hornworm, um, maybe a cabbage looper. You guys have maybe seen some of these things. These are the larval forms of insects. They cannot digest protein. Um, if you've heard of late blight or early blight, uh, actually not early blight, but um, um, maybe uh, powdery will do on your winter squashes and your cucumbers, uh, downy will do on your lettuces. Those are um, sort of airborne funguses, and they can't um, digest a plant that's making good lipids, fats, and oils. And finally, we come to the, the beetles. The, um, what's a good example? Japanese beetle, um, squash beetle. People see of different kinds of beetles. They can't digest what we call antioxidants, phytonutrients, uh, terpenoids, phenolics, alkaloids. And those, com those compounds, interestingly, are the compounds that give our food flavor. Only when your carrot tastes like a carrot <coughs> does it have the compounds in it that make it indigestible to insects and diseases, and also then only does it have those nutrients necessary for you to flourish. You need these elements to, at the core of the enzymes, to build these complicated compounds that make things taste good to us. We're hardwired, we're animals after all. We're hardwired with the ability to tell them what's good and what's not. And so when a carrot tastes bitter, it doesn't matter if it's an organic carrot, that's your body telling you it's no good for you. Only when a peach tastes like a peach is it then good for you. If an apple has a sort of a sweet kind of flavor, but not really any apple flavor, they use enough chemicals to kill the insects and diseases so they can harvest it, so they can sell it to you, and you pay for it by the pound. But it doesn't have anything to do with how good for you it is. This is, I don't know, I think it's kind of exciting. Oops, something happened. I made this in Charlotte. Charlotte. I was on a bit of a rant. Yes. <clears throat> there we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi. See, I, I started it. Yeah. Only 45 minutes. All right. I'm, I'm getting to the end here. Um, Functionally, can have the effect of increasing 
organic matter in any given soil by half a percent a year. That's safe. That's Australia, that's North America, that's Asia, documented citations, no problem. Half a percent per acre on the world's agricultural land equals enough carbon taken out of the atmosphere and put into the soil to sequester the 120 parts per million that have been added since 1750 in three and a half years. Full stop, end of conversation. We still have the carbons in the oceans, these come back into the atmosphere and come back into the soil, but no big deal. Right? Nature's got this. If we work with her, if we work with her. History of food quality, average mineral content in selected vegetables 1914 to 1917. This is some very basic minerals. This is calcium, magnesium, and iron, and cabbage, lettuce, and tomatoes, and spinach. You don't need to look closely at the numbers. This is the USDA data, it's nothing fancy here. Um, I mean, they took it offline a few years ago because it was <laughs> pretty embarrassing. And Japanese on the same data, the you know, English on the same data. This is this is this is the plan. This is um, since before um, you know agribusiness, since before chemical fertilizer. What happened to Albrecht? Why did Albrecht stop being the head of the University of Missouri, 1853? Because after World War II, there was a surfeit of production of armaments, explosives, and chemical weapons. There was way too many factories able to build explosives than we had need for explosives. So what did the intelligent entrepreneur businessmen do? They looked for a new market. The new market was agriculture. And the reason that the Oklahoma City bombing was such a big bomb was because it was, and it was made out of fertilizer, is because fertilizer is still made out of those things that explosives are made out of. It's really quite good marketing. Um, you want to talk about um, Agent Orange and <laughs> um, mustard gas and all those things, right? Those are just your run-of-the-mill, everyday used fungicides, herbicides, pesticides, right? It just happens to be that farmers are using those things because, you know, if you look at the causal, causal relationships here. If you were a historian and you were sort of being empirical in your analysis, there's a really nice correlation here. I mean, there's a really nice correlation. And, and you know, basically the universities were given uh, money to hire professors that taught this, and pretty soon they were given money to fire professors that taught that. Um, that's where our light ring universities are and have been since the 50s. Sorry, I'm a graduate of our here in Massachusetts light ring university, UMass Amherst graduate. Um, I'm an organic farmer, and I'm talking about organic farmers too, so <laughs> universal in my critique. Um, so human health, um, oh boy, we're in a long time. Enzymes, you're an educated audience here. Um, an enzyme uh, is, I like to say enzymes are those things which are used in living systems to build compounds and take compounds apart, so to build carbohydrate out of sugar, to build protein out of amino acids requires enzymes. It's kind of like if you've got a car and you take off the um, brake pads, you need a 5 16 socket to loosen that nut. Um, we've, got, uh, we've got metric, we've got the you know, American standard, we've got um, Phillips head screwdrivers, we've got flathead screwdrivers, we've got Allen wrenches, we've got all these different tools that have different sizes and shapes that you can use over and over again to put things together and take things apart. That's basically what an enzyme is. And the reason that enzymes have different sizes and shapes is it because they have at their core an element. So we have copper-based enzymes, we have zinc-based enzymes, we have cobalt-based enzymes. Each of those enzymes has a certain size, like one and a half inches, and a certain shape, a certain bonding geometry, like tetrahedral or icosahedral, right, dodecahedral. Different elements have different sizes and different shapes, and then the core of those enzymes have different, different shapes that are used to put proteins together to digest lipids, etc. Okay, everybody got that? That was quick. You guys are intelligent. All right. So um, people have heard that um, okay in a car if the um, muffler wears out, what do you do? Take it off, get a new one, right? If the brakes wear out, like I just said, the brakes wear out, brake pads, take brake pads off, put a new one in. Those are machines. Bodies, living living systems, actually are constantly rebuilding. So, as I understand the data, on average, we get about 4 billion new cells a day. Each one of us is part of our basic rudimentary function, breathing, you know, drinking water, et cetera, et cetera, sleeping, 
4 billion new cells a day. If you do the math on how many cells you have in your body, that means you get a new body every six months, plus or minus. When your blood takes two or three weeks, your bones take seven years, but on average, you get a new body about every six months. Um, at the core of every cell, you get four billion new cells a day, is a nucleus. Inside of every nucleus is DNA. Everybody knows all this. DNA is a really, really, really big compound. To put that really, really, really big compound together, you need a bunch of enzymes. There's a bunch of different kinds of enzymes. When they did the Human Genome Project, they documented all the different enzymes that were needed to replicate the DNA. When they had the, the enzymes documented, they were able to identify the elements at the core of the enzymes. There's a sum total of 56 different elements. Different elements. How many elements can you need? 56 different elements necessary to replicate your DNA once. Part of basic rudimentary function is 4 billion new cells every day. You get where I'm going. If you don't have these elements, present, you don't have the enzymes present. If you don't have the enzymes present, the pieces of DNA that need to get put together don't get put together. The pieces of DNA don't get put together, they're hanging loose. What's that called? It's called a genetic marker. You've got genetic markers for colon cancer, for diabetes, for you know, heart disease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can identify these breaks in the DNA with the enzymes that weren't present when they got put together, and then therefore with the elements that were missing which is the cause of the enzyme not to be there. This is a very logical argument. I know you guys all have IQs at least 120, so I think everybody's following me, but there's not season of attention being paid. It's kind of exciting. We're really following along here. Um, so we can track something like diabetes, and we can see you know, the correlations between the markers and the enzyme and its chromium. So our medical system right now manages diabetes. They give you insulin, which is something that your body can't make because blah, 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 blah. But you can solve the problem by giving your body what it needs. Right? The foundational issue is a limitation. Just like um, Liebig said, right? You're missing the copper, you're missing the zinc, et cetera, et cetera. System function drops off. And there's a really nice correlation between these mineral deficiencies and our degenerative diseases. Um, I think I probably have to end on this topic, but I'll just quickly through a couple, I only have a couple slides left. The Hippocratic Oath is something that I've been told doctors all swear when they graduate. Uh, it says, first, do no harm. Hippocrates, I think it was like three, 400 BC, Greek, I believe, uh, is there the father of Western medicine. Hippocrates, all American medical doctors, when they graduate, swear the Hippocratic Oath. In short, first, do no harm. Second, let food be thy medicine. Third, never let me ever be tricked or conned or anything else into prescribing poison. First, do no harm. Second, let food be thy medicine. And third, let me never prescribe poison. That's the Hippocratic Oath. Look it up. Uh, as I understand federal debt, um, we've got our military debt, we've got our just plain old debt, and interest on the debt, et cetera, and the numbers say that we're going to be screwed, not by those, but by healthcare. So anybody who cares about actually the country, um, you know, I would consider this building soil to be foundational to solutions. Um, that's what my last couple slides are here. Uh -oh. Oops. Uh, what, oops, okay. What can you do? Uh, very simply, this little gizmo is called refractometer. It's a tool by which one tests crop quality. Um, it's about 170 years old. There's no batteries in here. All you're measuring is refraction, the amount of light bends. You take a, a you squish a carrot. I've got some little vice grips here. You squish anything, potato, cucumber, lettuce leaf, kale. You squish a drop on it here, you get a reading. It's got a little chart up here. And you look for average good excellent. So I would suggest Anybody here who wanted to have a positive impact on the world, had fantasies of you know doing good works, etc. Um, one of the most rudimentary things, which is profound, is to buy the highest quality food possible because the highest quality food possible actually has those nutrients. And all the way it gets those nutrients is by having a living ecosystem in the soil, which has these corollary effects. And so it's not only good for you and your family, and you know it's a systemic solution to your diseases, yours or your family, but it actually has the effect of carbon sequestration. So um, this is a little chart. I'm not going to talk about it. I got some 
in the back and having coffee afterwards. This is called the Bricks Chart. It gives you the answers of where you're at. Agribusiness, personal little point of mine. Um, I suggest anybody who's part of the anti-GMO movement, anti-Monsanto movement, um, that the solution to the answer of fighting, which I don't think is the answer, is actually getting people to eat good food. Because when you eat good food, you put money towards farmers who are growing good food. Farmers who are growing good food don't need chemical fertilizer. They don't need GMOs. They don't need herbicides and fungicides and pesticides. And so you can simply wean us, wean the system. You don't need to overtly fight because you know we're fighting those, right? It's not usually good. The solution systemically for the culture at large is actually, I would suggest, this is, this is where I got my soapbox, I'm sorry, not the solution. I think a good idea would be that. Um, the consciousness, and I don't have consciousness. I'll talk about that later. <laughs> That's why I get really excited. Thank you very much. to 
locals who have been there their whole lives and knew how to grow bananas and how to grow cassava, how to grow you know, everything else that we had never even heard of, let alone tasted. And I can tell that whole story because I've been farming now for you know 15 years, and that experience entering a new culture, entering a new environment that was totally foreign to me, took a long time for me to even learn the basics to understand my surroundings, my culture, the people, let alone you know, how it happened, like grows. So I've been farming, growing animals, growing vegetables for the past 12, 15 years, and I still am really very much that person who really feels that they've only had two months of training. It's a lot to learn. And we're going to just go over a little bit of what I've learned from myself, from studying, and from the animals that we've raised over the years. Um, how we believe the best way we know how to farm is just through experience. And so it's going to go through these slides. So we talk a little bit about alternative livestock production because. What we're doing, the way we raise our animals, is different than the conventional system. Even different from the way some folks around here produce livestock. So, that's a little about me. Um, Pete Jens back here at Burr started in 2007, really, is when we started our business in earnest. We had a few chickens there, a few laying hens, and we began with our business in our backyard, literally, with a few uh, laying hens just for fun. We got them at the oven farm from Farmer Ray and started with 11 uh, lovely laying ladies as we called them then. And we put them in our backyard, did a little coop, and within a month of them eating all the grass that was in that coop with the fence around it, we noticed them jumping over the fence. So we like, built the fence higher. So we built the fence 12 feet tall. They were just looking through the fence trying to get to the other side. So at that time, we uh, came to know about the Polyface Farm, Joel Salton, who is a pioneer in the uh, pasture-based livestock business, and we decided to start putting our animals out on pasture. And so that really is what this talk is about, about our experiences of bringing animals to the land, not forcing animals to do anything in general that they don't want to do. So we talked a little bit about inputs, a little bit about mob raising, which is pushing animals to maximize soil health and to maximize uh, ingestion of green forage. A little bit about forage cropping, what we do with our pigs, and some, some research that we've done over the last few years and our approach to soil health. We can just go through these things quickly. Um, like I said, we are a pasture-based farm. The difference with the way we manage our business is that we are managing our animals intensively. We are managing our business intensively, as opposed to putting our chickens in a coop and letting them just be in one spot. We are taking them and putting them through a system for their health and for the soil cell. And then we go to grow, growing healthy animals in part with growing soils. And like I said, bring animals to the land. Our business is mainly the direct market is how we have started, how we continue to run our, our business uh, with a focus on the highest quality uh, forage and taste of our animals. We look to make money in our business so we can continue to grow it over the seasons. And we find, uh, finally, we do what makes sense ecologically and not what we find to be the easiest. We do have some inputs in our style of farming. In the picture you see on the right is a Google Earth satellite image of our broiler hoops on Sutter Field near Route 2. You can see them watching through the field, move every day, and the pattern uh, in that the land is recovering behind them. 
So the inputs that we mainly have besides our active growing fields are, are, are our main input is a grain ration. And we uh, purchase certified organic grain. We want to support other organic farmers out the world. Um, so we feed only certified organic grain. For typical, for, for example, our broiler chickens, there's a ratio of how much grain they need to how much uh, weight they put on. And broiler chickens is generally three to one. So the three pounds of uh, grain, they, three pounds of grain, they generally need one pound of so a 16, six pound live chicken will yield, will consume 18 pounds of grain, 450 chickens per group, which is how many we grow in a group like that, will yield about eight, will uh, cause us to feed about 8,000 pounds of grain. And most of that grain, besides putting on muscle mass, is returning to the soil. So we are, in essence, putting 5,000 pounds of fertilizer into the ground as we move our chickens to the fields. Another input example besides our purchase of grain is we did this last year, although before our winter set in, we had a local landscaper dump in uh, leaves onto our yard, great bedding for pigs, free, very clean, and you'll see the next slide what that field looks like now. Uh, pound for pound, these are a great source of minerals. If you're looking for something that you can have time to break down, uh, it's a great uh, source of organic matter. That's what the field looks like right now. It's a field of O's and P's that we sowed in the early spring. We did not remove any of those leaves. Those leaves were turned and composted by the pigs on site. The pea tendrils and the oats we sowed in March and we harvested about a thousand dollars worth of pea tendrils off that field in the last few weeks. So it's an example of letting the field rest, still gaining an economic return, and treating the uh, soil extremely well. We'll continue to cover crop that field through the season and potentially return it to uh, vegetable production next year. So this is not a picture of our chickens, it's the one picture of the whole slide show that's not ours. I want an example of mob raising, which is more associated with cattle than other livestock. And so we're going to do a series of slides here in the mob raising feed. So mob raising really is a high density, high impact type of management for livestock where you are pushing a group of animals very quickly, very hard onto a uh, portion of land to encourage those that livestock to consume the harsh and to lay down a uh, mat of manure and to compress whatever uh, forage they don't consume into the soil. So one of the things I, I, I like to say about high density, high impact, is that on the, on the uh, flip of that is low density, low impact. If you have two chickens in that same photo, they're not really going to impact the land that great. So mob raising really is about frequent movement, letting the land rest renew and then rebuild. So the aerial shot you saw before of those groups watching over the pasture really, this is what's going on inside there. This is a slow growing breed of meat chickens called Freedom Ranger or Red Broiler. They are uh, in a 8 by 14 foot coop that at this time we keep them inside to keep them safe from moms family at this point, but also to, to stimulate that mom raising um, concept. They will be in a, in a group like this and moved once or twice a day to spread manure and provide them with fresh forage. That's what it looks like behind them. So they're just washed in the field, food and water every day. The 
and moved once or twice a day. And you will see next what that looks like about four or six weeks later. So this impact is important to generate and stimulate the soil and the microorganisms to encourage life and bring that grass and stimulate those roots to regenerate. This happens consistently. It's, it's, you, you see this and you think that you're ruining the ground. And this is what happens. And you can see the lighter shades of grass color in between where there's less activity. So Jen and I visited Holly Face Farm, Joel South, and down in Virginia a few years ago. This is a picture I took. It's a, it's a herd of several hundred cows. And I love this picture because you can see the cows across the way, which is another farm. And those cows are looking like, what is going on over there? But what Joel would, told us is that those cows are just wandering back and forth across the field, nibbling here, nibbling there. And his cows are hungry and ready to move, and ready to eat, and focused. And so you can see the person in that, uh, the woman in that red shirt, winding up that electric fence. They're moving these cows every day, sometimes twice a day. And what's important in this picture is the little inset picture right there, where you can't even see the cow's head because that cow is eating. It's not wandering. It's not daydreaming. It's not doing anything except rushing to eat quickly because he knows that there is competition right next to him. So you can also see the grass here does not look lush or beautiful, but one of the concepts about mom grazing is that you're letting your grass grow to full maturity, letting the seed that's form allowing that plant to really regenerate and push out a lot of energy. And the cows then come, they jam all that biomass into the ground, they eat half of it, jam those stems into the ground, disperse those seed heads, and then they move on just like the prairies. So you can see that line of where the cows are moving off of that field and into the new paddock. These are really simple systems. It's just single-strand electric wire you're focusing now. So this is our um, our laying in operation. We use these mobile handmobiles to bring the chickens to the pasture. We have been using fields around several towns for many years. We don't have a lot of acreage on our main home site, so we need to bring our livestock to where the land is. This is a field next to White's Pond, if anyone's ever seen them up there. We have two coops on the outside and one nest box coop on the inside. They live together, they live in the coops, they lay eggs in the nest box coop, and we move them forward every day or two. It's not as intense as mob grazing. We use a perimeter electric fence to contain them, but with similar to mob grazing, you have most of your activity in that tight area right around the coops where they feel safe. Turkeys. So our turkeys are here ranging in a field of O's and P's with similar shelters behind them where you can see the fence line I just moved is the little arc around those field P's and O's. We just open them up and they're going to town. They will do the same thing. They'll consume the field P's and the O's. They'll trample half of it and they'll go back into the soil and move the soil. do with rabbits too. We put about 10 or 12 rabbits in a hutch, open bottom. They consume a lot of forage and clover. They grow actually slower because they are eating a lot more, um, they're eating a lot less of a concentrated protein and eating uh, a wider range of plants but their flavor, even though they have less fat, is more intense. 
And the picture on the left here is the red with the worms we have. We do have a rabbit tree where we keep our growing uh, mothers and, and babies, and the manure spills out onto the ground on the, on the sides of the rabbit tree, and we just let that build up over the season. And I dug that just to take that picture today, and three inches under the ground are thousands of red wigglers digesting the rabbit. So like Dan said, one of the things that we try and do is we try and keep our soil covered. But because of our land base, we are limited. And so what we have chosen to do with our takes, which is a little bit unique because our land base is limited, is that we grow forage crops for them. These are generally fast-growing crops that within 30 or 45 days of seeding will yield a, a harvestable or a crop that could be what's called a down the pigs. We use anything palatable, peas and oats, winter rye, barley, sedan grass. Fetching clovers are slower to grow. Sometimes we'll sow them in the fall and they'll enjoy them in the spring. You can make spring have a mono. This group of our pigs contained by this double strand electric wire, you use single strand. Once they get used to the the system, they are very easy to contain. This is a virgin field where they have their heads down and they are eating roots and shoots and anything that they um, find enjoyable. A lot of the roots have uh, a lot of carbohydrates in them and they um, really love that. So here's a little field, a starter field for young pigs. Pigs are monogastrics. They're not like cows or sheep or goats, but they can't really fully digest a lot of the, the roughage. But they Matter, but as they grow older, they do have a greater ability to do that. Uh, as young uh, pigs, we like them to start out enjoying forage. They eat it up. This is a, a early uh, spring sowing of winter rye, which is very fleshy and sweet. Those two little funny pigs are called magnets, so they're an old breed. Again, you can see the little inset picture of the pig. Oats and peas, very sweet, very tender. They will knock down a field like that in, in days if we let them. So this is a field of Sudan grass. Sudan grass is a quick growing grass for the corn. That grows very quick in the summer after your last frost date of May 15, something that you can sow in the soils. It grows very, very quickly. You can see the insect here that they Love to just snap off that, that stalk, some under almost like sugar cane, and eat that. And they leave what they don't find palatable. A lot of these fields, a lot of these fields that we inherited are really low nutrient fields. And we decided not to supplement with them with any fertility. We just let the fertility build over time by incorporating the, uh, the, the biomass and whatever manure is positive. These are the same fields a few years later. This is also Sudan grass. You can see how lush, shiny, and beautiful it is. We will turn them into the field sometimes at you know one feet high. Sometimes, depending on our rotation, we may let them go in three, four feet high like that. They run in there. You can't see them. They're running through the bush. And those leaves are, are shaking. But they they bend down in there. They spread their manure. They eat the whole field. I'll show you some shots right after that. And so one of the things we do after they do work in a field like this, is we let them work the whole thing, and then while we don't want our soil exposed too much, we will spread a cover crop, very broadcast spread it, and then we'll go over it lightly with a rototiller, and that's it. We don't prepare the land like a vegetable crop. We don't till it and disc it and harrow it and beat it up to death. We just spread, I'll just spread a, uh, a cover crop right on top of it. It'll look just like that. Can it see the seeds and lightly just expose the soil a little bit? Rains, rains come and, and those crops, the next crop comes. So these are all heritage breed pigs, large black, old spot, uh, tamworth. These are fat ear pigs, meant to be bred, bred in, mainly from England to be raised outdoors, extremely hardy. We don't worm, they live outside, they have a good life. So SARE is a, a, a government organization called Sustainable Ag Research and Education, and they're um, they provide all kinds of grants to 
different types of researchers and growers. And we have applied for several farmer grants over the years. And one of the things that we did a couple years ago was something called this mobile cooling wagon. What we wanted to do, the problem we were having is that in the middle of the summer, summer's getting hotter and drier, the pigs don't sweat, they want to be in the shade of the forest. We wanted to bring them to the cover crops. We wanted to bring them to the fields because what we were seeing is that the fields had patches of fertility where they were causing their manure, or they were some areas they weren't spending a lot of time. We wanted to control where they were going in a humane way. So we came up with a mobile cooling wagon, and it is basically uh, reservoirs of water and misters underneath, attached to timers. And on uh, hot days, the misters will go off, and they will s s hang out underneath the, the wagon, jump up and dance and go crazy. I just had a video, but it's really fun. And you can see them hiding out over there. Keeps them cool, keeps them comfortable. What happens is when pigs are cool and comfortable, is they get up and they eat. So our goals are always for the animals to be happy and healthy and feel comfortable and eat. So we make our money. So this wagon, where are we telling? They go. So we could go, you know, a 20 acre field that is no trees, no shade, nothing, and they will be perfectly comfortable. So there's the wagon, another, you know, I just went on Google Earth and, you know, these images are there. So you can see the wagon, and you can see we do have a couple of shelters and a feeder out there for them. You can see how we're moving them around in the field. So we want them to really work up a field so we can re-spread another cover crop. So we're about to head into the, the green patch, and then we'll head out into the main field, and then reseed it all. Another grant we did in 2009 was with our meat chickens. And we were trying to figure out, one, how we can keep the grass at proper height for the chickens without mowing, and how we can make more money off the land at the same time, and how we could stack a field with multiple layers of activity that was manageable from a labor perspective and brought us in. So we did another type of grazing, similar to mob grazing, but a little less intense, and that's called chip grazing. So at that time, in that field, we had much less predator pressure, so you can see that our chickens were not roaming around back there. And in a little chart here, you can see you know, our little system. A couple coops, a little sheep shelter, and then we created little ships of patterns. You can do this, you know, if you have a whole sheep in your backyard, you want to mow you along, you need to focus them, because otherwise they're going to wander all around. So a little strip, leave that strip, and move on. And it worked really well, because then the area was already mowed down for chickens, you can't really deal with the tall grass. We just marched them through. So then you had sheep manure and chicken manure, and you had a field really recovering well, and you had no fossil fuels burning from mowing, and we ended up doing this system for four years on this field because it worked so well. So, you know, that's my whole presentation. We just wanted to talk about. how we manage our animals using constant motion, moving them to fields, moving them through pastures, keeping in mind their health, profitability, and making sure that we're taking care of the land we're on. I do want to just say a little bit about our logo, which just has that grass swoosh at the bottom. It's there because we really focus on giving our animals on pasture. 
That's it. So we have some time for questions uh, for either uh, Peter or Dan. So do you think we can do this without microphones in the audience? People's microphones in the audience? You can do that. Stand up if you're going to. Uh, I have a quick question for Dan and then one for Pete. So, Dan, where do you get spores to inoculate the soil? Uh, um, uh, they're in the cabinet under my wife's desk. Um, <laughs> I got five different answers for that one. Um, I realized as I um, left that I didn't tell anybody that my formal day job um, is running a nonprofit. Um, and we have a membership. Membership based on profit. If you join the organization, we have things like that available for members. Um, or you can go onto our website and see uh, all the dozens of companies around the country that have it available. Um, so it's a, there's, as with any other product, there are numerous quantities and qualities and prices available for any number of every person. And then, Pete, um, you mentioned that the kind of farming that you do is Farming, would it be possible to apply this to? I mean, this is sort of boutique farming. Would it be possible to apply these principles potentially to, you know, a much more full-scale, I mean, large-scale farming? You know, you know, for instance, you know, Joel Salatin is. You know, for Peter, why do you think the question? She wanted to know what piece of it could be applied to a much larger scale. Well, no. and also about sequestering carbon. And whether you sequester carbon. I mean, it, it can be, but really, what's better is that it's done on a smaller scale, more broad. So there, there's more people like us doing it everywhere. And Joel Salton is raising, you know, he's renting farms like crazy in Virginia and Washington, D.C., and growing, you know, 50,000, 60,000 chickens, which is still nothing compared to the main, you know, production houses in the industry. But really, there needs to be more people like us on a few acres. We do actually have right now friends of ours who live in Weston, who had a big yard, who came to us in the winter and said, we want to raise some chickens. Can you help us? So they help them build coops. We buy them the chickens. We buy feed in bulk, so it's economical. They have a few coops. They pull through their yard. We bring them to slaughter for them. You know, it doesn't take that much work. We don't need that much space to produce food for your whole neighborhood. What do you do about crackers? I have a terrible trouble with my chickens alive. Predators are tough. You know, Jen and I always say everything likes chicken, so they are a target. We lost this year 40 laying hens to a box. We put electric net fencing up, they got attacked. We put double strand electric fencing on the outside of the neighborhood, the box screen, they still got inside. You do your best. You give a small flock, you lock them inside at night. Uh, we, just like a big vegetable farm that deals with woodchucks in the perimeter or some disease pressure, they have a lot more crop. As backup. We lost 40 laying hens, and we had another thousand. But it makes a difference, and it's depressing um, when you lose your birds and you lose one. Uh, really, it's due diligence. It's you're responsible for your livestock. So if you, you know, we've seen fisher cats. We've had friends who fisher cats have literally ripped open their chicken wire hoops and gotten inside. Use hard work on this time. There are a little, a lot of little devices out there that you can try. What about chicken doors? If, you're not home in time to get your chickens in inside at night. A lot of it is really just making sure your coops are tight and you're there for them. I mean, the reality is, you know, you lose birds. There's a lot of predators around here. And that's our chicken coop. Yeah. Question um, Have you had trouble with these um, mites? 
food can get on the chickens? And are those really residing in coops? So I'm kind of curious if your more free range approach is a strategy for dealing with mites. Yeah, red mites are a problem, especially now during summer when it's hot. They hide in crevices. They overwinter. They are prevalent, and they will stress your birds out. They will cause them irritation, uh, especially in the evening, in the morning. If you notice your birds making a lot of dust bats, that is a sign that maybe they have some irritation. You can use that to make just earth if you like. You can spread it in uh, in the ground that they are maybe making their nest holes in. Or you can have a box with sand, and you can put that major spirit in there to help um, combat mites. There are some organic sprays you can use with dusts in, in the coop. Um, one of the things that we try and do is use as little wood as possible, and uh, use plastics if you can. You can call crevices. Uh, roosts made out of wood are just you know, a haven for vermin. You can use plastic pipe, so, you know, so that's, those are some ways that we try to mitigate it. But you know, we have, we have mites too. They get away from it during the day, but at night, you know, they definitely come back. You go collect, we've had problems where you go collect eggs at night, and there could be mites everywhere. And then you know that they're suffering. Just curious about um, the kind of fencing that's required and expensive fencing, particularly when you're around 117 or areas with heavy traffic. You really can't afford to have your animals get out, both for liability and also just for the animals. So, what do we do about fencing? Well, I mean, we're using portable electric net fencing that costs about a dollar a foot, linear foot. Single strand electric, like the pigs, is really pennies. So we are, um, we have, it's a huge investment for us. And we constantly are upgrading our fences and our chargers, and it's one of the biggest management practices we have to manage in the type of farming that we do. It's keeping track of our fences, it's making sure they're in good shape, it's testing them all the time, and moving them frequently. We, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's part of, we couldn't do what we could, we couldn't do what we do without the technology of electric fences. We don't need, you know, do we need a physical barrier? We've never had a physical barrier. We've always been on land that we don't own, so it's never a luxury we've ever had. Yes, we've had pigs get out and wander, but you know, they're not like dogs, they don't run for the hills sometimes. They will, most of our livestock, they get out. Once they realize they're out, they want to get back in. So it's not letting our livestock be somewhere where we are not present for a very long. So we are checking our pig fences twice a day. We're checking the integrity of our fences all the time. But we run, we run um, our pigs on an orchard 10 miles away with just electric fencing. We run, Animals at eating ground. We've run, you know, um, uh, chickens and broilers in fields, you know, three, four, five miles away from us. Things go wrong, but most of the time things go right because we know what we're doing now, and we it's our investment. It's it's, it's the when we care about it. when when our chickens get killed, I feel bad. You know, I know that eventually we're going to kill our chickens, but I know how I'm going to kill our chickens. I feel bad. I know those chickens are stressed out when that's happening. We, they have sometimes a lot of our chickens get a little PTSD because they've just been attacked every night by a fox and they're just ready and waiting for that to occur. So you know, we have neighbors who call us to make our and running, we race out there. So we can do it. Hi, I have a question about soil. Um, do you have any comments about biochar and its value in enhancing soil quality? Good question. Um, I think, uh, in honest truth, I'm much more ignorant about it than I could be or should be. Um, I've heard a lot of good things. Um, actually, having a workshop at my house next month on how to make it and how to use it, uh, how to use making it to make um, diesel and uh, gasoline and propane 
hot water. Um, I've heard a number of good things um, about biochar, and it's one of those pieces of the puzzle that's not uh, a silver bullet per se, but certainly if you're operating on a small, you know, square footage or acreage, um, you can dramatically improve your systemic function, function really rapidly. Hello, question from Dan. Uh, Brian Mann from Sandy Pond Road. Um, you mentioned that uh, the um, 120 parts per million increment over the last 100 years? 250, I think. 250 years. Um, that amount of carbon dioxide can be removed by 3.5 billion acres of agricultural land in three and a half years. Right. What is the yardstick for planting trees or otherwise, which would maintain the present level of carbon dioxide, so that cumulatively we can have a target for planting to sustain that? Um, Do you get the drift of my question? Uh, it sounds like you're asking for a more of a uh, sophisticated answer than I've got. Um, I don't know a hell of a lot about trees per se. Um, certainly, I don't mean. What I do know is you can put a lot of trees in and it depends entirely on their environment how well they do, how many of them die or how well they grow or you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I do think, I think it's fairly, it's correct that the tree stores the majority of its carbon above ground, whereas grass or something like that stores the majority of its carbon below ground. So I don't think that trees are necessarily um, a bad thing you're focusing on. Um, for me it's a question of where's the, um, lowest thing in fruit. And um, I think that money talks, and you know, I used to be much more young and idealistic than I am now, you know, I may still see a bit young and idealistic. Um, I think, you know, farmers are, 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 you know, farming the land around the planet, and if we can give them the tools to make more money growing healthier plants, and have that be, have a corollary of that be carbon sequestration, and it can happen so dramatically. For me, that feels like much lower hanging fruit than Say we need to plant 50 million trees next year, and this is where it's going to happen, this is how it's going to grow. If we can use economic leverage to the systems that are already in place, uh, for me that's just a, I mean, I'm, I'm a real question of more than I grow trees. So would you be suggesting that uh, uh, there might be bonuses for, for farmers who uh, plant carbon sequestrated crops in preference to? Farmers, farmers who grow crops well are going to have a corollary effect of that being carbon sequestration. It has nothing to do with whether you're planting this variety of tomato or that variety of corn. It has to do with how you're growing the tomato and how you're growing the corn. And the ones that aren't making much sugar because their biochemistry is not working well, A, aren't making much sugar, and B, aren't putting much into the soil. But a healthy plant, a big caveat in this whole thing is that healthy plants put as much as 60% of the sugar into the soil because they can afford to, and that's what they healthy animals, healthy plants do. Um, so it has much more to do with your agronomic management than with what crop you're growing per se. Trees, cucumbers, uh, cows, chickens, the whole thing. Dan, um, well, I'm concerned about organic farming you now with agribusiness. You know, when you go into Whole Foods, I think we'll be in more markets. And, yes. you know, are they loosening some of the regulations? No. I used to could a big organic farm in the 80s. I know the work that's involved. I, I, and I'm very, like, I buy it, but... I, I, was, I was present when my parents were, you know, coming over meetings and deliberating about the, you know, the nuances of the organic standard before there was one. When they were on the committees writing the standards in the early mid-80s, our farm was certified organic in 80, I don't know, 86, something, a long time ago, basically. I told my elementary school fourth grade science teacher I was an organic farmer, she said, all farmers, you know, Organic means contains carbon. All farmers are organic carbon. What are you talking about, just a kid? Um, and then sometime like eighth grade, all of a sudden, organic meant what it means now. I don't know what had happened, but kind of monkey head. And you know, a year later or two years later, the government came and took it over because the movement was not well organized. The social movement of organic farmers was, you know, these guys up here in Vermont, these guys over here in Oregon, these guys here down here in Austin, Texas, but we weren't organized and. There was a buzz, and the industry saw it, and the government, the government came in and, and took control of the word in 1990, wrote the NLS, the NLP, National Organic Program, NLSD was put in, and by the late 90s, it's been corporate control ever since. So, yes, 
Um, what you can know with organic is that you have less toxins, which is massive. Um, you don't know if you have more nutrition. On average, it has everything to do with the farmer than not with the standard of organic versus conventional. It's everything to do with the farmer. But you do know you have less toxins, and that's major. Less bad is not more good, but it is less bad. That's what I like to say. I have a question for Matthew. Um, you have stated clearly that you see that your vision for how this change is going to occur is uh, through us consumers demanding better food, higher standard of food, specifically containing all of the rare earth elements. Not all, but just more. More is what we need. So, and you also talked about the refractometer as a way of looking at vegetables and fruits in the store. Yes. Is there anything we can do right now without a refractometer when we go to the store to compare the fruits and vegetables that What the old grandmothers do, which is to pick up a watermelon and heft it. You know, um, corn density, the average, the average bushel of corn in this country weighs, I think it's 56 pounds. And when farmers send their corn into the um, silo, or whatever it's called, um, they're paid based on 56 pound bushel. Some bushels weigh 48 pounds. Some bushels weigh 62 pounds. It has everything to do with the amount of nutrients, minerals, you know, copper and zinc versus hydrogen and oxygen in the actual crop. So hefting, actually, if you're sensitive, can give you some value. Smelling is major. Smelling is one of the best things you can do. Um, the tasting is the best, right? I mean, we're hardwired to test. We're like, you know, like the goats or the sheep or the chickens or anybody else. We're hardwired to go, yeah. you know, yeah, I want that. Um, yeah, so. You get it and weigh it with your hand. Heft it, yeah. smell it. Yeah. Um, if you get no aroma off of a tomato or a peach, okay. I mean, I don't know. People who've never eaten a peach off of a tree, I, I, I understand the concept of most people who've never eaten a peach off of a tree. Imagine those of you who know what a peach off of a tree tastes like. If the only thing someone had ever eaten that was called a peach was something from a store. Yeah. You know what those things taste like? Absolute crap. Absolute crap. People say they don't like beets. They don't like, you know, all kinds of things because they've never had a good one. Um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, Dan, uh, we pastured sheep and we're running into weed control problems. So the, there are things that sheep won't eat when you're graduating in the field. What are you doing for weed control as opposed to and aside from using parasites? Um, I think what he was talking about, about rotational grazing, is key. Uh, emulated nature is really important. Rotate. Rotate. Um, how, many, how many different animal types do you have running through your land? We only have the sheep. Right, well, that's not natural. Uh, you, you've, got, you've got the big, you know, four legged, so you've got the, the birds of various sizes, you've got the pigs. Um, there's a really good book I might have on there still. Um, I don't remember the name of the book. Um, Restoration Agriculture, I believe. Restoration Agriculture. Um, restoration. Is it rest restoration? No. Restoration agriculture. Restoration. I'm pretty sure it's restoration agriculture. Anyway, um, there's this guy out in Wisconsin who's been, you know, documenting this. Basically, he says, um, where where the land of milk and honey is, the eating of of your, as it were, is functionally a um, savanna. It's you've got grasslands, you've got uh, you know mature trees, you've got berries, you've got vines all together and you've got you know waves of different animals flowing through and the, the, the big bowline to go through and then maybe the chickens go through and then the sheep and goats go through and then the ducks and geese go through or how it works but when you've got that that flow of different um, animals that, that that do different things to the land you've got the, the different ecosystems that's really what it flourishes so um, the shortest thing to do i would suggest is make sure you've got the right number of animals for your land a and B, when they get done, come through and mow it down. We, um, do, we do mow every, yeah. every pass through. And when they get done, when they leave, how tall is the grass when they've they, they left the paddock? Uh, we try for about four. Four inches? Four. We try to, well, because of the parasite issue. Yeah. Um, Oftentimes, sheep will, will eat down to the dump. As above, so below. There's only so much root as there is top. And if you let the plants get eaten down to the nub, they 
the roots so sort of the wither up to the nuts. They go in, water it, cross the tent, cut it down, or we melt it. I would it. suggest if you are living, okay, five answers, they're all not sufficient. Um, I've given you five different answers, and none of them are correct. Mm -hmm. So and the answer must be minerals. I would take a soil test. We did. And I would, with who? Uh, we used um, analytics up north, and we did the micronutrients, and we did the general soil thing, and everything was fine. It's probably a longer question that we can talk about instead of bothering everybody else here. No. I'd be happy to talk about I'll it. I'll go look for the book. Soil, like, really I'll go look at the book. Yes. I have a question for you. Um, are you aware of the scientific studies and the nutrients in uh, eggs? Um, commercially produced or from hands who are living in pasture. I've seen one study, but um, it's not in a peer reviewed journal, and I couldn't get the raw data. I've seen more studies showing it's better or it's not. Well, I would use Dan's experience of how they taste. <laughs> we sell a lot of eggs. How they look? Are they orange or are they like a light yellow color? Yeah, I mean, really, that's it. We, we do know people, we've had friends who've had their eggs tested and compared with, you know, uh, conventional eggs or friends eggs or whatever. But really, it's really about the flavor, freshness, a lot of eggs. We visited, not to name names, we visited big poultry farms in New Hampshire for, we went into this vast room the size of this room refrigerator. Eggs piled everywhere. They are co-packing for Costco, Trader Joe's, sit in one place. And I said, well, how old are these eggs? I said, well, they only get dated when they get packed. They get dated when they're laid. Pack day is usually six weeks. Lay day is different. So, you know, and they wash all their eggs. When you wash the eggs, you wash them and bloom off the egg. Some Companies not so much anymore will re boil those eggs to seal those pores, but once that bloom, the seal that the hen lays on that egg, sealing those pores, once that is washed off, you take a really fresh egg and you get a little wet, it's a little slimy. That's the bloom coming off your head. When everyone's washing eggs, because it's required in the United States, not in other countries, that freshness starts to go down right away. And that's another quality factor that's affected. We don't wash our eggs unless they are dirty. When we raise our animals on pasture, we use roll-out nest box, we collect twice a day, we try not to wash more than 10% of our eggs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just curious why you don't have cattle, um, and why you would do cattle any differently than your current system? We, would, we don't have land. We would do cattle. It makes sense for the systems, just like we were trying to integrate sheep with our chickens. You know, we have, the way we're farming now is based on the land base that we have. You know, if we had 100 acres to raise pigs on, we wouldn't raise large crops. We would move them through the fields much quicker. In some cases, mob raise them, move them off the land. Pigs don't raise evenly, some, some livestock don't raise evenly, but, you know, we would do things differently. We're now adapting our systems to the land that we have now. But if we had more land, we would definitely you had cattle, or even if you went out over pigs, would you be hay, or are they living still on the land through the winter? No, I mean, I have a lot of allergies, so I don't really like eating very much. But no, I, I, if you have five cows, you can mock raise them. If you have a thousand cows, you can mock raise them. If you have one cow, you can put them in a little square with some water and minerals if your soil is completely minerals. And focus that cow wherever you want. Having an animal, one animal or one chicken, or and letting them wander around your pastures, your fields are going to go because they're just going to eat the ice cream, they're going to eat the clover, they're going to eat what's really tasty, and then leave the stuff that's not good, and they're going to deplete the reserves of what is good, and that plant is eventually going to die off, and all you're going to be left with is the stuff that no one wants to eat. Well, is there no more? Oh, one more question? Last question. Last uh, question. Question, I'll direct to Dan. Um, there's been a lot of talk about collapse of bee populations and discussion about pollinators recently. 
Could you put in context the form of, of agriculture that you do as a way of sustaining and retaining us to a balance in that regard? Sustaining and retaining us uh, to what regard? Uh, to uh, sustaining pollinator pollinators. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, the fact that it would be, make more sense to have polycultures of, um, I mean, I don't know what hell a lot about bees, honestly. Um, I, I haven't had the bandwidth to uh, keep them myself. Uh, the one factoid I know about bees is that um, if a plant has a bricks above seven, then the bee gets more energy out of pollen than it needs, than it takes to turn it into honey. Um, and if the bricks is five or four, then the bee is flying all over trying to collect pollen and when it gets back in there to drop it off and dry it down to the honey, it takes more energy to turn it into honey than they actually get out of the winter. And so they're functionally being drained by um, quality of food stuff, which is so weak, uh, which I think probably if you see the picture, it's a corollary for our own species. Uh, I think we're all entirely interested in it, and, we, and it's really, I um, mean, it feels to me like one of these win-win-win kind of dynamics, and I have been looking for um, something that would argue against it because it seems too good to be true. But everything I can see, you know, basically if we work with nature, if we do everything we can to build the underlying vitality of nature, uh, all the things that we want to see benefit in our deeper natures, they benefit. Uh, and all the things that we're struggling with, the systemic issues of the culture, of the climate, of the you know politics, all of these real deep systemic issues that a lot of us are sort of worn out with fighting are actually solved by going back to nature and you know encountering it more systemically. Uh, well thank you all for coming tonight and let's uh, give a